I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. My husband and I had heard about Babyfoot Lake, a beautiful, circular mountain lake near the Illinois Valley in Oregon. And since we were in the Cave Junction area for a few days visiting relatives, we needed some time to ourselves, so we decided it would be nice to go there. We packed a picnic lunch, thinking we would spend some time at the lake relaxing, since it was early enough in the year that it should be rather devoid of people, with traces of snow still lingering in pockets. As luck would have it, we were the only car at the trailhead, so we put on our backpacks, grabbed our hiking poles, and started off on the trail. It seemed different than the written description and directions we had looked at on the internet, as we found ourselves leaving the small valley and climbing at a steady angle along a steep cliff. We finally realized that we must have missed the trail that led to Babyfoot Lake. We had looked at maps before leaving the car, and we knew there was a higher trail, so we assumed that this must have been what we were on. We figured that the steep trail must eventually meet up with the other trail to the lake, so we decided to stay the course since we could see boot prints had already been on this trail this season. Well, we began regretting our choice after another half hour because we were still climbing, and at places the trail was just wide enough for a person's foot, one in front of the other. The way down wasn't quite straight, but if you slipped, it was about 100 to 150 feet before a tree or bush or maybe a huge boulder would stop your fall. Finally, we reached the top of the ridge, and the trail continued through the remnants of a forest along the crest of the ridge. There were many dead, blackened trees from the biscuit fire that raged through back in 2002 and burned thousands of acres across these mountains. We had watched a documentary about this tremendous fire, and its ravages were still so visible. It must have been terrible. There was also signs of recovery, with young trees and small bushes growing, but they were dwarfed by the huge dead pines that covered the mountains like grey ghosts with their arms outstretched, as if asking for sympathy. Many of them still had pine cones that had kind of burned right onto the branches. We had finally reached the very top of the ridge where someone had piled rocks to form a cairn, which, at the time, we hadn't researched enough to know what it signified. Not far from this spot was our first sight of Babyfoot Lake, several hundred feet below us. The trail led forward and looked as if it curved down and around the mountain to the lake. It seemed more like a jeep road as it was wide and rutted from what we could see before it dropped downward. We decided to take a lunch break with an overview of the deep blue pool, so we settled on a couple of boulders and began to unpack our sandwiches and water and enjoy the beautiful spring day. Suddenly, we heard a loud thump, and as we turned, a large softball-sized rock came skipping across the ground past us and disappeared over the cliff. Knowing we were on the highest point on the ridge, we knew it couldn't have fallen. It had to have been thrown, and we both yelled at the same time. There was no response and not a sound, but the wind whispering through the pines. We yelled again, but without response. The angle the rock had landed and rolled forward indicated that it came from the trees just where the trail started downhill, and that meant that it had traveled over 150 feet through the air before it hit the ground. We both know that anything that could throw a rock that large, that far, had to be too big to fool around with. We took the easy and safe route by packing up and heading back the way we had come. The hair was standing on the backs of our necks the entire way down the trail. We didn't hear anything or see anything further. By the time we got to where the lower trail was visible, we had both lost our interest in visiting the lake for now, so we made our way back to the parking area and were comforted by the sight of our car. Thank you. Jan Olson, Reno, Nevada. I took a three-day vacation beginning on September the 14th, 2012, from northern Nevada to the southern coast of Oregon. I take professional photos for a website I operate, and I was hoping to get in some great scenic shots before it got too cold and lousy for the rest of the year. My fiancé and I were on a hike about six or eight miles above Brookings, Oregon, in Curry County. We were on a hiking trail in a densely wooded area following a trail called the Loop Trail. This trail is about a quarter of a mile past the area called Natural Bridges Viewpoint. We'd gone down the trail without incident, although it was getting dark, and I felt as though we needed to hurry to get back, even though there was no reason to. It was just a feeling like the hairs on the back of my neck had started to stand up. I can't quite explain it, I just suddenly felt uncomfortable. 
we didn't see any other hikers while we were on our way back up the trail or on our way down. We stopped walking when we heard some loud snaps in the forest around us, like something was breaking tree branches. We looked around but didn't see anything at first. We decided to keep walking when we saw some bushes about 20 yards ahead of us sway back and forth. We stopped again and were then assaulted by a horrific smell that reminded me of garbage baking in the sun. By then, the nervous feeling I had had intensified, and I was really beginning to worry about the onset of fog and the fading light. The forest was misty, and it was raining lightly. We were climbing a steep part of the trail, and I gave it my best push to get to the end of the trail. As we were finishing the final climb, I turned and looked behind me. I'm not sure why. It was like I knew someone was watching, and yet I told myself I was just being silly. When I turned, I saw a head above some tree branches, with the rest of the body hidden by the heavy vegetation. The head was covered in dark, reddish-brown fur and was impossibly far from the ground. If this was a man, he must have been at least close to eight feet tall. I blinked a couple of times, convinced I was seeing things. The thing I was looking at did not disappear. Instead, it looked at me curiously for a few seconds and then moved out of my view behind a tree. I grabbed my fiancé's hand, too afraid to tell him what I had seen, because I thought he might go looking for it, and then I made my way back to our vehicle as fast as I could. I'm not crazy. This was not a trick of the light or fog. Something very large with the face of an ape was looking at me. I will never forget it. On June 4, 2001, I stopped at a beach north of Brookings, Oregon, for my usual evening walk with my golden retriever. When we crossed the creek, near where it empties into the ocean, to get to the north and rugged end of the beach, my dog, who normally runs a block ahead of me, froze. She did not wish to walk anywhere in this area. We turned around and took a walk on the south beach. At 7.15 p.m., heading up the path to the parking lot, I happened to glance up at the steep hills on the north. I was stunned to see what appeared to be two very large men, both dressed completely in black. I looked again to determine if they were a threat to me, and I saw they were, in fact, covered in black, and it probably wasn't dark clothing. The figures walked in a hunched-over posture, one right in front of the other, arms swinging like apes and taking very long strides. They seemed to see me and appeared to be coming toward me. I started to run to my Chevy Blazer. Partway there, I turned to see if I was being pursued, only to make eye contact with a large doe, perhaps less than a hundred feet away. My golden retriever and I were the only ones on that beach that night. It was almost sunset, misty, cloudy, and it had been raining all day, and the creatures were heading toward the ocean. This sighting occurred near an area east and between Gold Beach and Brookings called the Stackyards, also known as Devil's Stackyards. The area is on the north side of Pistol River. My brother, a rigging slinger, and one of our other fellows, a hook tender, were working in the rigging. Myself, a chaser, and the other fellow, a yarder engineer, were working the landing. Communications between the landing and brush were via handheld walkie-talkies. The guys in the bush spotted something moving across a prairie about 2,500 feet across the canyon from the yarder. They thought it might have been an elk, but weren't sure. After telling the yarder engineer about it and asking what he thought it was, the engineer had me get a rifle with a scope to get a better look. Both the yarder engineer and I took turns looking at this creature through the rifle scope for approximately 15 minutes. We both came to the conclusion that the creature was not a bear, elk, deer, or any of the commonly known big game animals that inhabit these woods around here. The creature was definitely walking upright and on two legs. It had broad shoulders, reddish brown colored hair, and it didn't seem to be in a big hurry getting to where it was going. I could see its arms swinging as it walked and seemed to have a pointed or conical-shaped head. I couldn't distinguish the facial features as it was just too far away. This creature was headed in the east-northeast direction from us, quartering up the hill across the prairies toward the ridge of the hill. We watched the creature until it disappeared over the ridge it was headed towards. On our way home after work, we debated what the creature was and concluded that it was a Bigfoot. The boys in the brush said that they had the feeling that they were being watched for a couple of days, 
and the hook tender mentioned that he had heard noises, like sticks breaking and something walking in the brush while he was working at his duties at the back end of the unit. At the time he heard the noises, he just passed it off as a bear or other game animal. He never mentioned anything of strange odors or of the like. We have heard of several other reports in the Brookings Gold Beach area in the past 30 years or so. One of my sons brought over a photo of a large track with toes in snow he found before Christmas 2005. My good friend's 12-year-old grandson says he saw a Bigfoot step over a guardrail. I also had an incident happen to me in the 80s while hunting deer. I never got a visual of the critter, but heard heavy brush crashing made by something running on two feet. What was really strange about it was that whatever it was made a really loud vocalization. It sounded like a monkey, a really loud one. I heard a similar vocalization on one of the other Bigfoot websites. I don't remember which one, but it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up when I heard the recording. I've been hunting these woods for a very long time and have heard every game animal vocalization at one time or another, and it was not from anything that I have ever heard before. Whatever it was made the vocalization as it was running through heavy timber and thick underbrush. In 1969, at the end of August, four other boys and myself went camping near Babyfoot Lake. I was 16. At around 11 p.m., three of us were asleep and two were up. Even though we were within the wilderness area, we had parked our car some ways down a very hard-to-negotiate road by a stream bed and had ascended a small hill where there was a campground with easy water access a little further up the stream. One boy, George, went down the hill to get something out of the car, and as he approached the car, something which had been hanging out near it took off and ran downstream. It was so loud that Matt, the other boy, heard it too, and they said it sounded like a jeep going through the brush without a motor. But the real fun started about two hours later, when horrible screams started to be heard from a distance. The sound eventually woke all of us up, and I must say, they were of an incredibly scary nature. Not cats or anything even like that. More like metal ripping in a factory. Eventually, it became obvious that the creature was making its way towards our camp by the stream. And, machetes in hand, we all hid deep in our sleeping bags. The camp spent about a half hour, estimated, under siege by something walking around on its two feet and continuing to let out these massive wails while us boys shivered in our sleeping bags in utter terror. Finally, the creature started to move away, and as it did, two or three of us looked carefully out to see a huge, hulking form moving away in the moonlight. This is absolutely a true story. Whatever this creature was, its wail could raise the dead. George and Matt were the only skeptical types, and the experience shook them tremendously. I was driving home from work in December of 2002. It was about midnight. I was driving on Highway 138 heading east, about 15 miles out of Roseburg, Oregon. As I rounded a curve in the road, I saw what I thought was a deer way up ahead crossing the road. I slowed down a bit as I got to where I thought the deer would be. What I saw was a figure standing just off the road by a fence with one hand on the fence post, and it turned as I went by, watching me. I thought it was a man, so I stopped to see if he needed help. I got out of my truck with my flashlight in hand and started walking back toward the man. I was working the light beam along the fence line when I heard the most god-awful sound I ever heard in my life. I froze. I was in the military, and I work as a psychiatric nurse, and I don't scare easily, but that scream scared the crap out of me. It sounded like a dying calf in a hailstorm. It was ranging in tone, starting out high-pitched, and then ending up as a threatening, low-pitched, guttural sound. I dropped my flashlight and ran back to my truck and spun tires getting out of there. The next day, on my way to work, I stopped at the same spot. My flashlight was still there. I didn't notice any footprints, but I did see the tall grass had been walked through on the other side of the fence. I looked on all the fence posts in the area where I saw it, but I didn't see any evidence of hair. As to what it looked like, I only got a brief look as I went by but it had to be at least seven feet tall. I base this on the fact that I drive a Dodge Ram truck. When I'm sitting in the driver's seat, my head is six feet off the ground. The spot where this thing stood is in a depression in the ground. When I park my truck in that spot and stand where I stood, I couldn't see into the cab at all. And yet that night I saw it. Its head was even with mine. 
I was looking directly out of the window, not slightly up or down. I couldn't make out features as it was dark, but the lights of my pickup slightly illuminated the area where it stood as I went by. As I said, I thought it was a man at first who needed help. It looked so human at that moment. It wasn't until later that I came to believe that it couldn't have been a man. No man could have made that sound. What I remember seeing was a figure standing next to the fence. Its head followed me as I went by. It didn't appear to have shoulders. It looked like the head just spread out until it became shoulders. It appeared to have long hair all over. At first, I thought it was a long jacket, like a duster. But as I looked back, it had to have been fur. But it was the scream that stands out in my mind. It was like a warning. Don't come closer. At least, that was the message I got. I left Oklahoma City with my two brothers, Bobby and Jimmy, and a friend named John. We headed for Oregon in August 1979 for a possible long-term stay. After a five-day drive, we came to a small town of Drain, Oregon, where Jimmy had been a few years earlier with his ex-wife and child. After about three weeks, we settled in, and everything was looking pretty good for us. A couple months passed, and one early October morning in 1979, I got up and asked my brother Jimmy if he knew of a place to go deer hunting. He told me that he had been to a place a few years ago, just outside a small town called Yonkala, a few miles south of Drain on Highway 99. So we took off to go check out the area he told me about. We drove south of Yonkala about two to three miles and turned to the west on an old logging road. We went up the road for about two miles and came to a fork in the road. At that time, I asked Jimmy, do I go left or right? He told me it doesn't matter. So I turned right and the road ended up at the top of a mountain about two more miles up. The road that turned left at the fork ended at the top of a mountain about three or five hundred yards away to the left. Jimmy and I got out of the car for a nature call. After about 20 seconds, Jimmy told me to look over on the other mountain top. He saw something move. I looked and I told him that I didn't see anything. About 10 seconds later, Jimmy told me, Look, I saw something move. I looked and told him that I... And that's all I could say. At that time, we saw a big black thing walking like a man. It walked over to the edge of the other mountain, the mountain we would have been on if we had taken a left at the fork in the road. It was standing there for about 10 to 20 seconds before it walked back to where we first saw it. It stopped and looked at us for about 30 seconds, then turned away. That's when we saw a little one standing there beside it. We watched as they walked away from us over the mountain. They were about three to five hundred yards away from us. The big one was about six or seven feet tall and about three to four hundred pounds, very muscular. The smaller one was about four to five feet tall and probably about a hundred to a hundred and fifty pounds. After we got over the shock, Jimmy and I left and drove down to the fork in the road and saw a man on a horse. We stopped and asked if his horse was acting funny or if he saw anything strange. He pulled out a big pistol and told us he was not worried about it. We stopped in the town of Yonkela to get something to drink and told some people there and they didn't care to talk about it so we left. I hope you take this story seriously because you're the first that I've told it to in a long time. In July of 1978 when I was seven years old I traveled to Oregon with my family to visit relatives. We spent three weeks in the state and I was lucky enough to see what I think was a Bigfoot. We camped in an area that was dense and close to a shallow river. It was almost like the camp was a bald spot with a wall of brush and trees around it. There was a trail that led to the shallow river, and although it probably wasn't far, it seemed so to me. The late afternoon was sunny and warm, and everyone but my cousin, my uncle, and myself went to look for herds of elk. We had campers to sleep in, and my uncle and cousins were both napping when this sighting occurred. I was outside one of the campers playing when I heard a rustling of underbrush. I never smelled anything that I can remember or heard a sound other than the rustling. When I looked up, I noticed that a small sapling, maybe the size of the end of a baseball bat, just bent completely over. The sapling was behind a thick wall of what appeared to be some sort of berry bush. I'm not sure what kind though. I was curious and walked over to where I'd seen the sapling bend over, thinking there was a squirrel hanging onto it or something. That's when a large hand reached out from behind this brush and grabbed a handful of berries. I had to be eight or ten feet away at this time. 
The hand was huge, with long reddish-brown hair. It was clear that it was a hand and not a paw. I stood there in total shock. When I managed to run, I ran for my life. It didn't chase me or anything, but I saw all I wanted to see of it. The hand was scary enough. I probably would have died of fright had I seen the rest of it. I got back into camp, which was not far away, but far enough for my napping cousin and uncle not to hear anything. I never screamed or made a sound, just ran and sat as close to that camper as I could. I realized that when I sat down in the dirt that I had wet my shorts. I was seven years old and I have never done that before. I kept my mouth shut until my mother and other aunts and uncles got back from elk sightseeing. I told them everything and they told me that it had to have been a bear. I described the color of the hair and I was told that it must have been black hair that I had seen because the area only had black bears. I wasn't stupid. I knew the difference between a hand and a paw and the difference between reddish brown and black. I managed to let them convince me that I must have seen a bear, and we left and came back to our home state of Mississippi. A few years later, I was in the sixth grade. We had a library period, and we could look for and check out any book. I found a book with a black cover, and if I'm not mistaken, the title was Bigfoot. I hurried to check this book out and read it from cover to cover. It wasn't until that moment that I figured out that the animal that I had seen those years earlier had a name. I had never been so excited in my life. Ever since, I've been interested in all the sightings, shows, and books. I've thought about telling my story for years, but I, like everyone else, have been afraid of the teasing and skepticism of others. My family says, we believe that you believe what you saw. I will believe it until the day I die. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to enter the November giveaway contest. Just listen to the video linked on your screen and follow the instructions to enter. Thanks and good luck.